Good morning. Welcome to day three of the Decolonizing Hellas Symposium and our discussion today on Mediterranean diasporas and Australian settler colonialism. This will be the first discussion of the morning here in Athens, but for our panelists in Australia, Saturday evening is fast approaching. So we apologize for encroaching on their leisure time and thank them for joining us at this hour. Um, so thus far in the symposium, we have connected to uh, North America and to, uh, of course to Europe, but this is our first uh, connection towards Asia and to Australia. Um, this panel has been organized by a great collaborator of our initiative, Andonis Biberoglu, who is a cultural historian at Griffith University. He is also the co-founder of the Australian Migration History Network, a supporting institution of decolonizing Hellas. And Andonis works on the relationship of migration, race, and settler colonialism. His concept of the Greek migrant cum settler has been very helpful to us in rethinking the relationship of race, territory, and sovereignty as has his research into the way immigrants in their in settler colonial states have been recruited into, but also contributed to co-constituting white supremacy, which is a point I think we really need to think about. Um, it, yesterday in his keynote, Mah Mah Mahmoud Mamdani um, was very clear about how migrants are settlers on stolen land. And he, so this is a topic that has already come up in the symposium. Um, but I'd like to say to the panelists that this is a new, really kind of a new, very new um, in the Greek context to think about that connection. This panel in large part has been inspired by a forthcoming issue of Australian Historical Studies, which Andonis has co-edited with Zora Simic, one of today's panelists, on non-Anglo migrant encounters with indigenous Australia which foregrounds a transnational and transcultural approach, moving out of the nation frame of studying migration, homeland, and diaspora, examining the ambiguities of non-Anglo positionality in relation to settler and indigenous and problematizing that binary, and finally, the emphasis on cultural um, production as a field of analysis. So I want to quickly introduce the panelists and then give over the, the floor to Andonis. Our first panelist uh, will be Matteo Duto, a researcher at Monash University in Melbourne, who, sorry, Melbourne, um, who works on migration and media focused on collaborations of indigenous, migrant, and multi-ethnic communities. Matteo is actually with us here in the Mediterranean um, at the moment in Tuscany at the Monash University Prato Center. Our second panelist is Francesco Riccati, who teaches Italian and Mediterranean migration history at the Department of Italian Studies, also at Monash University. Uh, and last but not least, Zora Simic, who is a historian and gender studies scholar and currently head of school in history and area studies at the University of New South Wales in Sydney. I want to make a, a word about the about the, com the, the comments. Um, we have a small online audience because it's early. It's early in Greece and late on Saturday um, in Australia, but we'd like to encourage you to use the YouTube um, chat section and I'll be following it for questions. And I also want to um, reinforce that all of this material will be available online and there will be an afterlife to this um, conversation. So, Andonis, welcome. Thank you. Uh, you can hear me then? Yes. Okay, brilliant. <laughs> Hi everyone, um, it's a pleasure to be here and take part in this wonderful forward thinking symposium. I'd like to acknowledge that today I'm speaking to you from the lands of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples, the land in where, where Australia's capital city is, is based. And as a Greek Australian uh, who grew up, if you will, in the masculinist spaces of Australia's ethnic Greek communities and whose mother was born and in, in the north of Cyprus uh, under, under British administration. And also my father's family arrived here in the early 20th century from Gasolorizo, an island that has experienced various forms of coloniality from Ottoman, French, Italian, British. I'd also like to pay my respects to indigenous elders past, present and emerging. And to acknowledge quite firmly that sovereignty has never been ceded on this expansive country. I'd also like to share my thanks to uh, Penelope Papaelias uh, for her tireless, consistent, dynamic way that she has helped bring about this symposium. 
I think it goes without saying that the intellectual diaspora, if you will, of Greece has uh, expanded for good, for good reasons due to her labor over the past few years. We'd also like to reiterate something that Professor uh, Bonaventura de Sousa Santos noted in his opening keynote, and that is that this, you know, make the gesture towards the quality of this program and how that's emulated in the fantastic questions being asked and addressed in this forum. It's very encouraging to see, um, especially for us who want to collaborate with you from Australia. So further to uh, Professor De Sousa Santos's remarks, I'd also like to, to comment on his distinction between what he called the after generations and the inaugural generations. Um, this, I think, very much speaks to us. Um, we, as historians, do not see history as a closed book. We're very much interested, as I hope you'll see from our panel today, Mediterranean diasporas and Australian settler colonialism, that we're you know, very firmly tied with this notion of inaugural generation. Uh, and we think that you know, as historians, we can work towards rethinking, reinterpreting, reflecting on our pasts, uh, and in doing so, imagine alternative futures and change the present. Like Penelope said, I'd also like to give a brief nod to Professor Mahmoud Mandani's comments last night on his distinction between immigrants and settlers. So as Penelope said, you know, uh, Professor Mandani noted that settlers are distinct from surgeoners, uh, slaves and indentured laborers. They arrived, as is often quoted within settler colonial studies, they came to stay. In doing so, settlers carried their sovereignty with them. Migrants, on the other hand, moved to spaces belonging perhaps, if you will, to someone else. And as such, they moved to someone else's sovereign place. And I hope you can see from today's panel that we're interested in perhaps disrupting this distinction, to think past the settler, colonizer, and colonized dichotomy. If we're interested in thinking about the colonial processes at play when examining groups who we might consider to be perpetual foreigners within. So before I proceed further, I'd also like to note, as, as Penelope gestured, we're very much speaking here as Australians. And I, I think we, we all believe um, that we can engage in a productive dialogue with the questions and themes being raised by the initiative. So studies of Mediterranean migration and diasporas in Australia have often been uh, explored within a settler national frame of analysis. That is to say that the stories of Greeks, Italians, Turks, Egyptian, Syrians, Lebanese, migrants in Australia has been framed as central to the nation building project that showcase migrant experiences of struggle and, and success. A story that, if you will, frames migrants who arrived in an Anglo British world that was largely hostile to their presence as people who worked hard, often in small businesses or nation building infrastructure schemas and then climb the steep ladder of social mobility to become successful, assimilated, hyphenated Australians. In this sense, the historical experience of Mediterranean migrants who are often racialized as white but not white enough, white but racially distinct from other whites, racialized but also racializing, has become a central story of multicultural Australia. The work of our panelists today, all in different ways, contest this limited national framing of migration to Australia. We're interested in realigning stories of migration so that they engage with past and lingering legacies of colonialism. We draw upon settler colonial structures to both broaden studies of migration and diversify histories of colonialism. Um, you know, and as, I, and as I mentioned, here we're keen to disrupt this prevailing uh, dichotomy between settler colonizer and colonized. We're concerned with unraveling how an assortment of individuals and groups 
from the Mediterranean region positioned themselves as loyal to settler colonial ideas, while also exploring the cultural specificities at play in how migrants have laid claim to settler colonial worlds that they have come to call home. So what if we were to reframe the historical experience of Mediterranean migrant struggle and success? What if the corresponding stories of Mediterranean migration to, settler, to the settler colonial Anglosphere were understood as interconnected stories of colonization? Migrants say moving from the British protectorates and possessions in the Mediterranean, or from the Italian mili uh, military presence in the Dodecanese, or from the French mandates in Lebanon and Syria, to British settler colonial societies in Australasia and North America? What if Mediterranean mobilities in their varied forms, peoples, texts, ideas, visual culture, architecture, attitudes, were seen as part of wider trans-imperial, Ottoman, British, French, or transnational or regional, say Greek, Italian, Egyptian, or Balkan, Eastern Mediterranean, or Southern European, or transoceanic, Mediterranean, Indian, Pacific processes of movement and exchange. What if studies of Mediterranean migration engage with indigenous so, uh, scholarly critiques of settler colonial culture? What would it mean to center notions of indigenous sovereignty and calls for self-determination in our scholarship, teaching and community engagement? Such questions foreground our various case studies of migration to Australia. They are questions which prod us to move away from celebratory and tiresome stories of migrant contribution. And they push for a reframing of migrant crossings as linked to colonial crossings. They force for a reconsideration of how modern Mediterranean mobilities entered onto deeply storied Southern landscapes that have their own indigenous, trans-historical and pre-colonial senses of origin, place and belonging. So, with this in mind, we're going to move to one of our first panelists, Matteo Dutto, whose work is very much at the intersection of transculturalism, media, and history. Matteo has been working in uh, doing some excellent critical work on the making of a very distinctive film called Ningala Ana, a documentary directed by Alessandro Cavadini in 1972 that charts how indigenous protesters gathered at the so-called Aboriginal Tent Embassy on the lawns of Parliament House where I'm speaking to you from today. So I'm going to share a screen, but pass over to Matteo, who I would like us to give us a little context about, this, about what the film is about, if you will, its circulation and its ties to the Mediterranean world. Grazie mille Andonis and Penelope for organizing this and uh, inviting me. Now, what is uh, Ningla Anna? In, I mean, the core of the film itself uh, is in the title, which is uh, Aranda language, uh, which is a language cluster in the Arandic language group spoken in the Northern Territory in Australia and means hungry for land. It is a film that has been described by one of the leading indigenous activists and historians, uh, Gary Foley, is the single most important film on the Aboriginal political struggle in the last 50 years and was produced and directed completely independently by Alessandro Cavadini in 1972 in collaboration with the Redfern community of Sydney and the activists that led the protest on the laws of Parliament House. It is a documentary that provides uh, an what we could call an insider view into the history of the Aboriginal Tent Embassy and documents the struggle and the clash with the police force uh, at a time uh, in which uh, indigenous activism was moving away from white pacifism into black activism and adopting a decolonial agenda. Just a few words uh, perhaps uh, on uh, the Tent Embassy before speaking about the film so that we can get a better understanding of what we're speaking about. 
because the establishment of the Aboriginal Tent Embassy in Ngambrin Gual country in January 1972, right on the lawns of the Australian Parliament House in Canberra and the protest movement that it generated are indeed one of the turning points in Australian history and in the history of Indigenous activism on a global scale. It is a point in which we see for the first time the rhetorical language of integration, equality and inclusion being replaced by this new generation of indigenous activists, all of them very young, most of them in their twenties. This language was being replaced by decolonial strategies of self-determination that moved land rights and culture at the center of the political discourse. They'd always been there since as early as the late 19th century, but this was the first time in which uh, this decolonial agenda was being placed in the foreground and at the center of the political discourse. These were young activists that were establishing ties with the Black Power movement in the United States. At one point there was also a Black Panther chapter in uh, Brisbane that was created by Dennis Walker, one of the leading forces behind the 10th Embassy protest, but also with other international movements. But most importantly, it is a point where we see activists, uh, in a sense, creating a new mode of protest. It is a new approach to political protest, an approach that persists to this day, because to this day there is a tent embassy in Canberra in front of the Parliament House. There are 10 embassies spread across Australia, one of the largest and most significant ones currently in Perth. And why a tent, you might ask? It was, uh, in many ways, it started out as uh, a piece of almost performance art. It was a way for Indigenous activists to challenge the Australian government by representing themselves as aliens in their own land, as strangers in their own land. So people in need of an embassy to represent their rights. And this is why the protest is called the Aboriginal Tent Embassy. So Ninglana. Ninglana has often been understood by us scholars as an agit prop documentary that documents the story of the protest movement, but the research that I've conducted shows that yes, it was that, but also at its core, it contains the seeds for many of the elements that would later characterize the work of Alexandro Cavadini with other indigenous communities, and namely an interest in working together with communities to decolonize not only the political agenda, but also the media representation of indigenous activism and a transcultural approach to distribution. It's a film that was shot over the course of just three months, starting in June 1972, which was at the height of the clash between the protesters and the police, right when the embassy had been already dismantled a couple of times. And just to give you an idea, a very brief idea about how the film has circulated and the importance of the film also in bringing forward the political agenda of the activist, in October 1972, a delegation of, act of indigenous activists that was led by Chika Dixon traveled to China for an official month-long tour at the invitation of the Chinese Communist Party. And this came at a time, in, remember, when the Australian government still didn't recognize the Communist People Republic of China. So it was a pretty big deal for the activists to be able to go to China. And during this visit, they showed Ninglana to thousands of people, including students, part officials, the general public. The film was, was screened in the Great Hall of People in Beijing and then across the country in a month long tour and proved essential to advocate for land rights on, in, on an international stage and also to embarrass the Australian government on an international stage because that was the main intent of the activist. Besides that, Cavadini also organized a number of uh, what we could call local screenings, completely independent outside of the mainstream circuits, uh, mostly screenings for indigenous communities and university students all across Australia, mostly New South Wales and Victoria. But the film also came to Europe in 1973, the first international screenings uh, of the film uh, in uh, on the international film circuit was right here where I'm based uh, 
in Florence at the Festival dei Popoli in 1973, and then later down the track, the film also made it to the Film Festival of Oberhausen in Germany and to other film festivals across France and uh, the Netherlands. Bear in mind that, and this is perhaps what can be interesting also for our later discussion, that while the film was touring extensively overseas, within communities in Australia, it had its first Australian prime time public TV broadcast only in 2012, when the National Indigenous Television Channel broadcast this in occasion to commemorate the 40th anniversary of the 10th Embassy. And the film has also been used by a number of different Indigenous filmmakers and artists for their own work, so it features in other works by indigenous artists, and it has also been screened at the Biennale in Venice. So this is just to give you an idea of the circulation and the importance of the film, but what is of interest for us, perhaps more, and this can also connect to the rest, is that throughout this period of time, Cavadini also organized the screenings of Ninglana for the Italian community specifically. And uh, despite his efforts, uh, in his interview, in the interview that I did with him, he notes that there, that was perhaps one of the most difficult things to do, to organize these screenings for the Italian community and engage with the Italian community with a film that is very much clearly not about the community, Italian community, but about indigenous activism and this decolonial agenda and the fight for land rights and sovereignty. And, he noted that he felt most of the times what he identifies as this, what he calls a sense of detachment from the side of the Italian community for these kind of issues, that despite the work that many Italian activists were doing at the time and engaging with indigenous activists, the overall community, mostly in, in Sydney where he was based, uh, he said that people really didn't want to hear about these kind of things. And there is something that perhaps we can discuss later all together is to understand why precisely this difficulty, he encountered these kind of difficulties. And we might reflect on this, but just one point that I, we might start from is that he noted that it's very difficult to discuss sovereignty, land rights and land theft with people who are just trying to make that same land their new home. So he noted that for, that for the community being told that they were not, that they were on sovereign indigenous land, this created a very complex issue because these were people that had been trying themselves to integrate with the society and to establish a new home. So there is a level of complexity there that is very interesting for us to discuss. Thank you, Matteo. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. We're gonna move on to Francesco now who has dedicated much of his career to uh, the reframing of the Italian presence in Australia. And underlying his work has been a key, keen focus to consider the interrelated processes of migration, race, and colonialism. And in 2019, Francesco edited a, a special forum in the journal Al Altre Itali, <laughs> that explores Italian migrants' relationships with First Nations people here in Australia, including their complicit, complicity in settler colonialism and their solidarity with Indigenous struggles. So I'd like to just ask initially, Francesco, uh, you know, what are the, some of the key points, if you will, that's, that you and some of your authors um, brought out from this innovative forum? Thank you, Andonis. Um... Well, first of all, I would like to acknowledge uh, as well the Wurundjeri and Bunurung people of the Great Kulin Nations on whose land I live and uh, work and pay my respect to their elders past and present and acknowledge that sovereignty uh, was never ceded. Um, so the special issue of Altritalie um, which, by the way, is available open source, so I hope later uh, 
perhaps on the YouTube, we can share the link. It's a special issue that I have uh, edited and I've worked on it with uh, a number of uh, colleagues, mostly from Italian studies, but also uh, an important uh, um, indigenous artist, uh, Paola Balla, uh, who is of Italian background, in fact. And uh, many of the essays in this um, special issues uh, go back to the personal experience of many of these scholars, uh, both as people, as migrants living on the land, as children of migrants. In the case of Paola Balla, as both an indigenous person and a child of an Italian father, uh, but also as a scholars who have engaged with these complex topics. So I would say that some of the main uh, ideas that sustain and, and frame these special issues are that, well, the first one I would say is that we need to take uh, decoloniality or decolonial attempts uh, seriously. And so really avoid the risk of a very generic uh, the use of the term decolonial for, for everyone. And instead we should uh, focus on what I describe as to moving towards uh, the decolonial, uh, not assuming or taking for granted that uh, decolonizing a country like Australia is possible. This means in particular to recognize that uh, as Don is also said, uh, sovereignty was never ceded and that the land has to go back to indigenous people for a proper decolonial process to take place. A second important point of that issue is that following scholars like Patrick Wolf, we believe that settler colonialism is not an event concluded in the past, is instead something that continue in the present in Australia. And this is very important not only to recognize the relevance of uh, the colonial approach today, both scholarly and politically, but also because the defense that often migrants in the post-war period like Italians and Greek use is to say that by the time they came as a mass migration to Australia, the process of settler colonialism was largely concluded. And this is an excuse, a reason they use to uh, absolve them themselves from complicity in settler colonialism. So reinstating the settler colonialism continued in the post-war period and to the present day also means a need to reflect on the complicity of Italians. A third element that I think is very important is to recognize that together with, the, with this complicity in settler colonialism, we also have to acknowledge that many Italian migrants have engaged in, in love and friendship and political solidarity with indigenous people as the example that Matteo uh, has just talked about um, uh, illustrate. So it's very important uh, that we also recognize that the complexity of the relationship between Italian migrants and, uh, and indigenous people. And a final point that I will make, which is particularly apparent from the contribution of Paola Balla is that if we want to approach this topic seriously, we always have to start from the perspective of indigenous people, from the perspective of indigenous uh, scholar. And as Paola Balla suggests here, it's particularly important that we engage explicitly with the work of uh, indigenous uh, women, activists, uh, scholars, artists who have really reshaped the way we think about um, racism and settler colonial relations in, in Australia. Thanks, Matteo. Brilliant. And, um, you know, further to this, a, a, more, a, you know, a more difficult question, perhaps, a historiographical question that we're, we're toying with is, you know, how do you simultaneously tell the story of, of Italians as settler colonial? Well, I think you've just addressed this actually, you know, to take on indigenous scholarship, but maybe I'll then turn to something towards the end there that Matteo was drawing on. And that is, 
with, with your extensive experience, right, in Italian Australian history, I'm interested for you to share with us how, if you will, Italian diaspora organizations, of which there are many in Australia, um, have engaged with you. And, and maybe further to this, how has their, what does their engagement tell us about dominant power structures in contemporary Italian Australian society? Thanks. Thank you, Andonis. I think that's a very difficult but very important question. And, and I would start from unpacking what being Italians and Italians in Australia means. Of course, there are profound differences. And, and, and you know, those are differences in geography, in uh, racial ambiguity, for instance, between Northern and Southern Italian. They are ideological differences as well. My experience uh, with sharing these uh, histories with the Italian community is that there is a very significant number of people who are progressive and recognize the importance of this topic and often has, have told me that they are rather shocked by the fact that they haven't really thought about this and recognized the importance of this kind of cultural shock to reactivate some kind of political awareness around these topics. We have also been told to fuck off, which is a, a, a non-polite term, but that nevertheless one that I like to share because it's uh, significant of what Matteo was talking about before, which is that of course, migrants who have been themselves victims of racism, migrants who have embraced the multicultural um, you know, rhetoric, migrants who have worked very hard trying to develop a sense of belonging or what in Italy we call sistemazione, a sense of feeling settled at home in the new country, suddenly are now told that they should also consider that their complicity in settler colonialism. And the reaction is uh, quite often strong. And uh, by many people, there is a clear refusal um, to engage with this. And, uh, and this is true for individuals as it is true for um, associations and, and institutions. So it's a very dif difficult uh, dialogue to to develop and i think one of the reasons why it's so difficult is that working with uh, uh, paola balla this important indigenous artist what i came to realize is that uh, you know the, the the direct experience of uh, people like paola really make a different a difference but at the same time is us italians who need to take the responsibility to develop this difficult discussion. We cannot just rely on indigenous people who are already doing a very difficult job for their families, for their communities. Um, and, and so, you know, it, it is a, a rather challenging space to work in, a very complex one. And the way I try to approach it is to think about a dialogue towards decolonization without making any assumption about what is actually possible to achieve. What is important is that we start to develop the kind of dialogues that we are developing here today and just encourage people to think more about these complex issues. Thank you very much, Francesco. We're going to move on to Zora now. Um, Zora, Zora's been working in the field of migration history for over 10 years and approach, has approached the topic from various angles, including uh, the, through the prisms of class and gender. In 2018, um, Zora, with her colleague Ruth Belland, published a State of the Field essay in Australian Historical Studies, um, our kind of premier historical journal in Australia. Um, and it was titled Histories of Migrants and Refugees in Australia. And in this essay, Zora and Ruth located a kind of recent development taken up by early career scholars who have begun to say grapple with uh, relations between colonizer, colonized and what we might think of as exogenous ethnic others. Kind of what, what we, Francesco, myself and Matteo are looking at. 
to more and more recently, which we'll get to a bit later, um, Zora is looking at a very fascinating case study of a post-war Serbian migrant writer and novelist, activist uh, called Threten Božic, but he's more, fam more familiar to many here in Australia under his pen name, B. Wonga, which we might talk about later. So, um, with, with this in mind, Zora, I'd just like to ask you kind of, there were two kind of main points within that essay in Australian historical studies that I'd like you to perhaps comment on. One is that you kind of make the claim that uh, migration history in Australia is everywhere, but nowhere. And you also then say that migration history is starting to engage with ind indigenous sovereignties and the issues that have come out of Indigenous scholarship. So um, could you just speak to those two points, please? You're on mute. I'm on mute. <laughs> um, thanks, Ed Donaldson, and thanks too to the conference organisers for inviting me. Um, and I'd also like to begin by acknowledging that I'm I'm come speaking to you from Sydney, which and in particular on Gadigal land of the Eora Nation, and also acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. Um, so to talk about that 2018 essay already seems like a long time ago. And part of the reason that Ruth and I wrote it was that we were inspired by the scholarship of people like Andonis and Francesco. There was obviously a new wave of historians coming through, particularly talking about um, histories of migration in a new way, including by talking about um, migrant complicity in settler colonialism, but also migrants as not quite equivalent to say British settlers. And this work was really exciting for us. But at the same time, while we thought migrant history was nowhere, was that mainstream Australian history, for, for want of a better word, um, still tended to treat it as quite marginal, even though migration is obviously central to the settler colonial project. And we were interested in questions like, why are some people permanently marked or, or, or more likely to be marked as migrants, whereas others are settlers and, and, and so on? So those, those kinds of questions. And the, the sort of mainstream Australian histories tend to be written in a settler colonial or nationalist frameworks. Um, so it means a lot of, and again, there's always exceptions to these norms and I'm not sure if any Australian historians are listening to this, this talk today, but um, so there tends to be recurring themes that Australian historians are interested in like frontier violence, black white relations, um, Aboriginal British settler relations, et cetera. And the, the history of, of, of migrant groups, not from Britain, um, tends to be quite marginal. I'd say, well, you know, that was one of our starting points for that essay. And, and some sort of big examples were that there was a big two volume Cambridge history of Australia that was published. We had chapters on all sorts of themes, but none on migration. And we could kind of understand that it's such a big theme that how do you quarantine it to one thing, but it was also quite striking and also drew the attention of a lot of people that do migrant history. Like, why, why aren't we in this big book? Um, so that, that was one of our kind of impetus for writing that, that essay. Um, and I think since then a lot has changed. And I think, again, it's because of the people in this panel, which is we're very excited to be part of this panel. I, do, I don't think, um, it, and so there's been two things that have changed. I think a lot, lot more Australian historians have become interested in migration history. So we've seen, um, you know, a lot of the sort of big names turning to migrant history and of various topics and from various angles. And we've also seen um, migration brought more, more uh, into the conversation about settler colonialism, which is really an animating theme in Australian history. Um, and again, I think that is because of people who were doing migration history rather than the people doing other sorts of history um, wanting to bring that in. So that's, and I, I do think it's changed. I think, and it's changed quite quickly. Like it used to be something that people, and there, there was a lot of histories of, um, interactions between migrants and Indigenous people in the White Australia period. So the former White Australia period, which went from like 1901 to 1973, where Australia had an exclusionary migrant policy, exclusionary immigration policy. So anyone that wasn't British or Europeans were ambigu amb ambivalently placed in that. So there was, there was a lot of history on that. But the post-war period of European migration, there's been less work on European migrants and Indigenous people. But again, that has started to change, including Francesco's work and although Andoni does the earlier period. Um, so yeah, so I think, I think that there has been a shift. So even since 2008, but at the same time, I still think 
I'd be interested to know what others on the panel think that migration history still is a little, uh, somewhat marginal in, in Australian history as well. Thanks, Zora. Um, so I, we just want to turn to this really fascinating case study that you've been working on, on uh, Stretan Božić B. Wonga, um, and how this is, this is a Serbian figure who is a literary figure who engaged with Indigenous worlds quite profoundly. Um, and his life story, if you will, complicates our understanding of kind of more generalised narratives of the migrant experience. So could you just share with us a little bit about Stretan Božic or, or Wonga's, <laughs> Wonga's life? Yep. Um, I will. I'll call him Wonga because that's what he, he prefers to be called. Um, I might and share if you want to share your slides. screen, yeah. go for gold. I will, just to give people a sense of, of who he is. This screen was from a, um, these slides are from a, oops, from a presentation that was a lot longer than the few minutes I've got here. But if I go through it quickly, you can see who he is. Um, I can put him on the on the full screen. So that's that's Wonga with his dingoes riding in his property in Gippsland. Um, so Wonga is a is he's still alive? Um, he's in his eighties now. He migrated to Australia from Serbia in 1960. Um, and the way that I became aware of him, I mean, my, my own background is Croatian and Serbian. Um, it was not through that angle, actually, not as a Serbian migrant, but in Australian literary history, he's been misrepresented as a hoaxer because he wrote under a name, the name Wonga, which he says was a name given to him by um, Aboriginal people in North Arnhem Land, where he he spent time in Northern Australia in the, in the 60s and 70s. And so there was, there was, Australia has a history of people writing um, you know, white Anglo-Australians writing as migrants or as Aboriginal people. So it's this sort of fascinating thread in Australian history. And then there's this one person, Wonga, who is, so he came to Australia from, that's him in Belgrade. Um, and he, the interesting thing about him was that his father had come to Australia in the 1930s and also spent time in Central and Northern Australia, which gave him this fascination with Aboriginal culture. And so as soon as he came here, one of his missions was that he wanted to know more about Indigenous cultures in particular, he, he sort of rarefied, uh, he thought the true Indigenous culture was in the outback rather than in the urban centres. So that's him. Um, and he was like many other migrants, he was both a typical migrant in that from, from the Balkans and, and other areas like Italy and Greece, who was a non-skilled migrant, he did labouring work and so on. So um, but he used those, those opportunities to find out more about Indigenous culture. He wrote amateur anthropology. Uh, he took a lot of photos of Indigenous people in Central Australia, and he was particularly interested in the, in the impact of nuclear testing and uranium mining on Indigenous cultures. He thought that there was, there was a genocidal intent. And it, he was writing all of this in the 60s and 70s, so a very... Um, you know, and, I, and when people started writing, he didn't start writing his novels and fiction until later. Um, and so these are pictures of his that are in the B. Wonga collection, which is in the Victorian Museum. Um, and then he started writing books, all with Aboriginal themes. Um, and then that's a story about him being exposed as a Serbian migrant. <laughs> this is giving you a very, very fast history of Wonga. And that's him with, you know, being interviewed. And he was always very straightforward. These are some of the covers of his books, which are actually designed by, you know, some would describe these as Aboriginalia and quite problematic in their representation, but they're paintings actually by an Indigenous artist who he collaborated with, as he did with the cover of these books. Um, and that's here with um, Eve Fessel, a Koori academic who started the first Indigenous Studies Centre at Monash University, in fact. So, and that's him now. And the interesting thing about Wonga is that this is a documentary that was made about him in 2018 by Serbian filmmakers. So he's become quite a, um, a figure of interest for Serbian scholars um, who see him as a profoundly misunderstood figure, i.e. misunderstood in Australia. Like they see him as someone who speaks truth to power about colonialism and its, and its impacts. So that's... that's Thanks, one Sora. <laughs> and just quickly, I'm <laughs> conscious of time, yeah. but can you just briefly also comment on you know, his sympathies towards Indigenous struggles and what it tells us about his own understandings of colonialism. 
Um, he did. Uh, so, so he's obviously that was that is his life's work is to expose what he sees as the ongoing effects of colonialism on Indigenous people, and his particular two issues were the effects of nuclear. Uh, testing and uranium mining on Indigenous people, but he was also interested in land rights as it, as it emerged as an issue and so on. He did make connections between what he saw as the plight of the Serbian people and uh, Indigenous Australians, which is problematic on a number of fronts. Um, and particularly in the nine, he started doing, he never did that in his writing. He would do it in interviews when people talked to him about his work, but he would always say, no, I'm, I'm writing about Indigenous stuff, but I, I was drawn to this issue because I saw some parallels in our cultures and oral traditions and so on. Um, but in the 1990s, he, he wrote a book called Raki where he explicitly brought Serbian history and Indigenous history together. And that was in the context of the Balkan War. So that was quite an unusual book. Um, so he did see that he had an affinity with Indigenous culture as a result of his own culture and his migrant experience, um, for better or worse. I think there's some really fascinating aspects of his work and some more that require interrogation, but uh, <laughs> he's, he's so unusual and in many ways ahead of his time, I think, as well. Thank you. Look, just one final thing, and it is a loaded question like I asked Francesco, but um, this is the relationship, if you will, between Australian multiculturalism and Indigenous sovereignty. Australia sees itself as an immigrant nation and promotes itself as an, a, a, you know, a vastly multicultural society. And yet, as we've heard from Francesco, and, it, and that emerged from the struggles that Matteo has explored, we grapple here in Australia with the fact that there have never been any treaties, any considered proper decolonial political efforts to extract the, the kind of British colonial gaze, right, from, mm -hmm. from our modern contemporary society. Could you talk to that a little bit? I know it's very loaded. Others are welcome to join in with this big <laughs> question at the end. Um, I think you've identified that one of the kind of tensions in Australia is that I think on some markers, it's considered the most multicultural nation on earth, in, according to how many languages are spoken and different ethnic backgrounds that people come from. On the other hand, it's also home to the world's oldest Indigenous cultures, over 60 to 70,000 years old. And those things have never been, you know, sort of reconciled. And I actually think, you know, the Indigenous Australians, as Indigenous peoples are, are leading the conversation here. Um, on this front at the moment. I would encourage people who are interested in this to read the Uluru Statement from the Heart, which is the um, a, a, a statement that results from a, a dialogues among Indigenous people asking to be, have a voice in, in that's for constitutional change to be recognised, their history to be recognised and also their unique presence in Australia to be recognised. And I think that that comes from decades of of, of activism and you know century, on resistance since you know the beginning of colonization um, but obviously this idea of Australia as multicultural some expressions of that have positioned indigenous cultures as just one of many cultures rather than the first culture and and, and acknowledging indigenous sovereignty properly and also indigenous sovereignty being you know to quote Aileen Morton Robertson incommensurable with with you know, um, what she calls white patriarchal sovereignty. So not only needing to acknowledge Indigenous sovereignty, but understanding what it actually means. I think, I think these are the big challenges. And um, I, might, I might share with everyone that the Uluru Statement of the Heart has also been translated into many, many languages, including Greek. And this has led to some ethnic community organizations like the Greek Orthodox community of Melbourne, Victoria, the largest uh, ethnic and oldest ethnic community, Greek ethnic community organization in Australia to publicly acknowledge um, their agreement, if you will, with the calls that indigenous peoples are asking for in the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Um, I should say that Uluru is an interesting uh, centre point, if you if you will, in Australia in, in Australian spatiality. It's a, it's essentially a big rock, but but it, it holds significant a, a significant cultural heritage value to the people who live in the centre of Australia. And so, 
um, this this kind of shift, right, in ethnic communities um, engaging with this political struggle that's not being acknowledged by the formal elite sections of our political class here in Australia is an important one. It's something that uh, says that there is a concerted public effort to engage that is diverse Australia to engage and recognise Indigenous sovereignty um, and grapple perhaps with what, what that means, what that means for, for our governance, what that means for our cultural identity, what that means for how we're also seen within the world in comparison to other settler colonial spaces. So it's often, it's often suggested that places like Canada and New Zealand have their own treaties as well as say um, South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So we have never, we have never had such, such um, political acknowledgement at, at a grand level here in Australia, but it is certainly, it is certainly um, in live, in live, it's certainly growing um, from the ground up, if you will. So look, I'm gonna open it up to our panelists if they, if they want to add anything to this, but also um, we are totally open to hearing what others might have been saying in the chats. Um, so please let us know, Penelope. Should I, should I, um, I have some questions and there's one thread here from Eleni Dimo in the chat section, which I think you've covered um, in, in part already, but um, she says she would like to hear more about why the Italian community was detached from indigenous struggles. Um, and do we know anything about other community reactions, Greek, Lebanese, to these struggles? I feel like, okay, you can, um, you've partially answered this. Um, and also be interested to hear about migrants' participation with far right politics um, and how panelists interpret that p paradoxical outcome. Sure. <laughs> Someone like to kick it off? Actually, in your eyes, but um, uh, that's a big question. I, I, I could also go to my question too, if you didn't want to, you want, does anybody want to speak to that? I, I, or maybe? Can, I yeah. can definitely mm -hmm. speak from a Greek context yeah. about the far right, and I'm sure yeah. Francesco could do mm. the same. So I'll just, I'll just quickly say that there were moments, say, in the, the, the growth of, 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 of New Dawn in Australia where significant significant Greek uh, uh, individuals um, engaged with this awful uh, extremist positioning of Greece. And this raised all kinds of interesting questions within the context of, of um, especially the party's anti-immigrant anti stance and how contradictory that was with their own sense of being a migrant mm. here in Australia. Um, but I also just might then say that a lot of our ethnic community spaces and the cultural productions that they produce, be they seminar, public lectures, the teaching of language, etc., is still very much dominated by, I think, a very dated and masculinist um, patriarchal framing of what Greek and Greekness constitutes in Australia. And so that's, that's how I would address that issue, it's that, that it's prevalent, that there is prevalence of far-right opinions and who disassociate themselves from Indigenous struggle and politics. Um, but it's certainly prevalent within, within Greek communities here. Um, Francesco? Well, I would add to that that, uh, of course, we were talking about racial ambiguities before and the fact that Italians and Greek, uh, Southern Italians especially, and Greek and Lebanese and so on are not quite white enough. So one of the main goals, so to speak, on a symbolic but also material level for many migrants has been an attempt to whiten, uh, an attempt to become part of uh, white Australia. And of course, a, a, a key element of white Australia is racism. I mean. Uh, in a sense, the fact that you are racist prove that you are no longer a migrant. I mean, I'm simplifying, but it's an essential element of that symbolic uh, rhetorical discourse that push part of the Italian community 
towards the extreme right is this idea that, uh, you know, in a sense that proves that now you are part of, you know, the whiteness, that you have made it into that, uh, into that space. But of course, we also know that because of that ambiguity, that is a space that you might come to occupy for a while, but there is always, you know, the risk that you are pushed back into a not so quite white enough category, depending on the what capitalism need, depending on what colonial thinking need, depending on what the structures of power need. Uh, you know, historically we see Italians can be more or less white and more or less almost black, depending on what functions they come to play into the politics and the economy of settler colonial nations. And so, you know, on the one hand, you feel like you are now white. On the other hand, you always have to reinstate that. And sometimes that means that you tend to over uh, compensate. And uh, I think that at least in part explain why part of the community then tends towards very right-wing positions, but also of course, remembering that there is a very long history of Italian fascism. And you know, so fascism is very much rooted in Italian history, and, uh, and 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 so we can, you know, it's inevitable to a certain extent that part of the Italian community is still uh, influenced by those uh, by those roots. In fact, in my job as a teacher of Italian, I often have Italian, you know, students of Italian background who have fascist grandparents, and and there is a very difficult process there, you know to move them away from those ideologies without alienating them because of course they love their grandparents very much. So, you know, those roots are still there, especially through family history. And, and I just might also add in the context of some of the discussions that have happened over the last few days, you know, the kind of and 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 going to kind of the the questions that the initiative is is working on within the context of Greece, is that there is a really interesting question to be asked when we think about notions of civilizational hierarchies. And so Italians and Greeks, in a historical context, in their process of whitening, when being questioned as as you don't belong here, you are not white enough to partake fully. In, in the Australian polity would draw upon their civilizational heritage to position themselves as archetypal migrants that belong in the Anglo settler sphere. And then we can see this emulated also in notions of Philhellenism and how Philhellenism traveled across the empire, but also into the, in say to the American polity. So, so then, you know, seeing how ideas of Greece, ideas of Italy are transcribed across our landscapes here, uh, play a role then in how, in how migrants wish to kind of position themselves as hyphenated Australians that are proud to belong and, and allowing themselves if, to using, using that phrase, you know, disassociate and disconnect themselves from other more troubling questions of Sovereignty. I um I have a question um to to add to this fascinating discussion. Um, I want to um to press on the word that we haven't really that ha that is in the title of the panel, but we haven't really um, problematized um, the Mediterranean um, and sort of push on this really like ama amazing examples of acts of solidarity and alliance ship, um, you know, to pull on that thread more than the complicity for a moment and ask whether in sort of progressive circles, like the Mediterranean in a way, even this panel, sort of the interaction that you all have because, you know, you meet in Australia, sort of creating another Mediterranean space um, in Australia, um, if there's possibilities there to sort of um, problematize the whitening of the Mediterranean, if there's any also kind of alliance-ship, let's say you mentioned Lebanese or sort of towards the Middle East or towards the idea of sort of a black Mediterranean, like is there any kind of perhaps utopian kind of 
dimension that could be imagined through sort of this critical Mediterranean that forms through um, these um, immigrants meeting each other in this space of ambiguous whiteness in settler colonial states. The second thing I want to ask has to do with sort of a connecting, especially in the Italian case, um, uh, connecting the dots maybe between um, Italian immigrants in, in Australia, the decolonized movement that's growing in Italy. We've, we've been in touch with um, people from, who are involved in that, um, which of course has to do much more with the relationship to um, Italian colonialism in Africa. Um, and then things that are happening, for instance, in North America, because Andoni's mentioned the sort of co the comparison between settler, you know, settler states, in, in especially in the United States, the whole discussion of settler colonialism is much, you know, um, in term, especially in migrant studies, m much less developed than it, it seems to be in Australia. Um, and it's interesting there how the Columbus statues have been so prominent, um, you know, as symbols of sort of, you know, uh, defacing those statues. The, the, the most um, ardent supporters, um, or some of the most ardent supporters, are Italian immigrants who often were responsible for putting up those statues because they wanted, in terms of what Andona just said about the um, cultural, you know, um, capital that they were trying to establish in their countries that they immigrated to. So like how, how can there be a better sort of um, knowledge transfer, which is basically what the symposium is about and why we want to talk to you between these different sort of sites of um, Italian, you know, experiences that are very different. Like, so historians would say these are all very different cases. So like, how can we, but still, it seems like there's even in terms of the, um, the Aboriginal tent um, assembly movie and sort of trying to show it in different spaces and like what, what kind of work could that do in, in, in these different spaces? I don't know if that was totally coherent, but I'm just interested in sort of where, where, what are the lines of flight in terms of the idea of the Mediterranean and among like different decolonialized or struggles in different geographies? If anybody has so, something to say about um, that. I'll, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll briefly speak mm -hmm. to the Mediterranean mm -hmm. um, question and I'll let, mm -hmm. I'll let our Italianists mm -hmm. speak to the other, the other context, but the other question. But in, from, from, from my sense mm -hmm. um, in a Mediterranean, mm -hmm. it kind of two prongs. If we think about Mediterranean as a, as a category a term, but also a geographical mm -hmm. space, and that is an important distinction. It's an important distinction in a migrant context because we only just have to think about, say, the politics of uh, restauranting. That is mm. Mediterranean cuisine, mm. for example. That you can go to a Mediterranean restaurant and somehow engross yourself in the experience of this like broad uh, Mediterranean culture. Um, attached to this in an Australian context, but I think also in an American context, are ways then that Mediterranean peoples were racialized in amalgamating ways. So if we take the racialized terms of Dago or a much more circulated term in Australia, WOG, which maybe Zora can speak to in another context, <laughs> but, but that, these, that these racializing terms that, that are kind of transnational, but also organic in how they are used and circulated in racializing uh, people from the Mediterranean region, then has been appropriated, adopted, re reworked to become self-identifying labels. Not so much war, well, uh, not so much the racial slur dago that certainly fell out of vogue, but certainly wog be became a word in which I, growing up as Greek Australian, could could that this is showing my age here in the nineties and early two thousands. I growing, growing up with various people from the so-called Mediterranean region who were classified as WOG, this kind of subculture that could be cool. It could be something that could be embraced. It could be something that, that allows you to draw ties with your Italian schoolmates, with your Lebanese, with your Lebanese homie, if you will. So, so that is that the way then the colonizing authority racializes these in-between immigrant groups, we're neither white nor white, creates a space in which the category of Mediterranean becomes a self-identifying category that, 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 that 
goes beyond ethnic distinctions that are limiting in how people actually live their lives. So I'll just leave that there. So Francesco Matteo to, to, on to the tag Italian on to context. That, it, we don't, we don't, here in Greece, people, there isn't a Mediterranean identity. Like it's in a way it's emerged right. there as a racialized solidarity among groups. Because in Greece, you aren't yeah, going to so come into I, contact I, with Serbians and become conscious of a Mediterranean. As right. Well. Yeah. So I think here then is also an important historiographical question at play. And that is often something that we are not quite having. We're not, we're not at this conversation. Mm -hmm. We're not having this conversation just quite. Mm -hmm. And that's what this forum allows. Mm -hmm. And that is this. Within the context of thinking about the history of migration, I, I suggested in the preamble to this panel that in an Australian context, migration is very much seen as a contributor to the nation. And in the European context, through national historiographies, mm -hmm. migration is very much seen as a loss, a nostalgia, something that, something that has, has, has lost. And so, so when we think about that contributing element that we're, we're, we're critiquing, mm -hmm. we can also see then that whole swathes of groups of people from this very distinctive region that's that's literally between East and West, right? Uh, could, could these contributors, these migrant contributors mm -hmm. are then also seen as one single, perhaps homogenous groups, with this, which is perplexing mm -hmm. and troubling, but it also creates different types of immigrant solidarities, mm -hmm. which are worth thinking about yeah. mm -hmm. and taking back over to you guys in Europe. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. the and Middle East, yeah. no, right? Yes, I mean, I agree with Andonis, and I have to say that I've been studying Italian migrants for a long time. Uh, for example, the relationships of solidarity and friendship and sharing of even, you know, family responsibilities with the with Greeks, with the Greek neighbors, for example, it's uh, it's a very important part of Australian history that I think we still have to explore, you know, because the dominant model has been the multicultural model where you have the Anglo at the center mm -hmm. and then all these separate ethnic communities, very little attention has been devoted to very complex relationships that have developed across ethnic communities. And in particular, in this case, I would say uh, what you could call across Mediterranean communities. So I think that's an important point that really needs development. And on the other questions, uh, very briefly, I would say that uh, I think that the colonial movement in Italy is true, is focusing especially on reflections on, you know, the, col the legacy of Italian colonialism. And that is very important. But I also think that there is a risk that, you know, because national Italian history is first of all, you know, the history of the Italian nation and, and, and in that space, migration have very often been forgotten uh, or at least overlooked. Uh, there is a clear risk uh, to me in focusing the decolonial uh, only on, you know, uh, the, the, the government intervention, if you want, in the colonies and forgetting that there were 20 million people leaving Italy, you know, throughout the century and mostly going to settler colonial countries like Brazil, Argentina, Australia, the United States, and playing a very important role in, in settler colonialism. And this is a sort of, a, you know, broad comparative history that still uh, is to be written, but I think it's a very important one. And we are having conversations with, you know, our colleagues in the United States, for instance, and we hope to develop also collaborations in countries like Brazil and Argentina. Um, and I think that's very, very important uh, because that's a global role that Italians have played, um, you know, across settler colonial countries and not just in relation to indigenous people, but also, for instance, when they started to replace slaves or indentured laborers once this uh, became, you know, illegal. Um, so Italians had a very important role there that still need to be explored much more. 
I, I just to interrupt, I think that's exactly the same parallel to what, w why we wanted to have this panel at this conference. Because it's almost like all those Greeks who've left Greece, what connection do they have to decolonizing Hellas? I mean, you know, it's, it's the same structural thing. Okay, Greece didn't have the overseas empire, but obviously the connection to the immigrants has to be part of this discussion, or the migrants from Greece. And the last point you, point, you brought up is also really critical to bring in the issues of racial capitalism too, and how this focus on migration history, which is, is totally not part of the Greek historical, I mean, much less so than in Australia, I would say, um, how, how it could open that discussion too. If I may just add one point, because I think on the point of uh, engaging across communities, this is another instance where we can, as Francesco was saying before, we should follow the lead of indigenous activists and scholars, because I mentioned earlier that the film continues to be screened by activists and scholars, and the most successful uh, way in which it has been used as a tool for transcultural activism and engagement across communities in, is in the work of Richard Bell, who created the, the embassy installation. And for example, when he set up in New York back in 2018, he also invited Alessandro. And wherever the mobile embassy is set, it works as a space for activism and discussion. So in 2016, and it was, he invited the Black Lives Matter activists, he invited the US First Nation activists, he invited Alessandro in. And in all of these instances, the film is used as a prompt mm. to kickstart a discussion around global strategies for decolonization between different actors. This, I think, begs the question as to whether or not these kind of discussions can be had within an institutional framework, because this is very clearly something that is outside of the institution. It is hosted by art exhibition, but is by design uh, something that is, is very much an activist component. So the question that we, I think, should be working on as scholars, but also with communities and with museums and organizations is whether or not these kind of exchanges can be hosted by within an institutional context and whether or not that would work. In a, can we have this kind of discussions in an in immigration museum? Can we have this kind of discussions with community organizations? Or is it something that needs by design to be outside of them because it has such a strong activist component that it doesn't fit within the institution. So that's one of the things that I think we as scholars and as activists ourselves should be focusing on. Because we can, and another way, and something that Francesca and I have done over the past years is to have these discussions by including this kind of work seen to the curriculum in the units that we teach, to have these discussions with our students and to represent migration from another perspective, something that is not necessarily centered on the experience of migrants themselves, but on the collaborations that those migrants had with other people. So there, are, there is, I think, a number of ways in which this can be done and we can, as Francesco was saying, the best way to bring this discussion forward is to learn from what indigenous activists have been doing already for the past 20 years. Um, Thank you, Matteo. That's uh, probably a pretty a pretty good concluding point. Yeah. And I just I to, to then kind of reiterate is that Australian Australian historical scholarship, which is always in combative dialogue productive and generative dialogue with, with, with Indigenous scholarship and activism that happens simultaneously within the institution, that is a lot of Indigenous scholars see themselves as activists, offer us new languages, offer us new approaches, offer us new conversations that we hope uh, if, if, we can, if we can collaborate future in the future, and I'm sure we will,
we can we can speak back and through to you guys. That is to say that your decolonizing e efforts and our decolonizing efforts can can always be in a productive dialogue. And where we're starting from is very much from indigenous scholar, scholar, scholarly intervention and activism that uh, I think can speak to where you where you guys are starting from in Greece and yeah. the Mediterranean more broadly. Um, yeah, so I, I th also think this is a, we, we have to stop, but it's also a great place um, to end because aside from making the connections between our geographies and histories and cultures, we're trying in the initiative to really move out of the, we are not in an institution, we're an initiative, we're academics, but we're trying to move um, out of our um, academic space and work with activists and artists and see how, how we can make this more of a public discussion. So we want help and advice and examples from you guys. So um, it was really great um, talking to you, uh, um, really amazing for, for us to, to learn about all these things and make the connection and hope to see you in Athens <laughs> soon or come to Australia okay. ourselves. <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah. Well, let's keep it going. Like I said, Penelope, it's been great working with you and good luck over the next two days. It's, it's, it's a really fantastic forum. Yeah. Thank you so much. Bye from Athens. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.